up to another good, good morning, time to go. It might give us an opportunity to course Got correct. that smile upon my face, cause there's excitement in the chase, this I know. Yeah, I'm going for the ride, and by myself I am alive, and I saw. Hey, okay. Still I run towards the wind, and let the challenge draw me in, cause I want more. Oh, we are all looking for adventure. We are all looking for adventure. We are all looking for adventure. Now I'm here in the Bardu mangroves, an ecosystem right in the edge of Sydney CBD. And I love mangrove ecosystems because they're a tangle of branches, roots and trunks and leaves. And with that, it offers a whole suite of habitat or homes for many different species of animals. Now what I intend to do over the next few days is get out here with my camera and discover what's living here. And from that, I want to build a food web and understand how this place relates to the wider world. Now it all begins with the sun. See, mangrove trees and all plants are what we call an autotroph. So they use the sun's energy to produce their own food. And in turn, that feeds everything else within this ecosystem. Now the mangrove environment is quite harsh. See a tide that comes in and out is also full of salt and the mangrove trees have to deal with this salt. One of the ways they deal with it is they actually get rid of it through their leaves on the underside using some special glands. The best way I can show it is with taste. Oh, they go good with chips. And their other magic happens down at their roots. Now these mangrove tree roots are actually quite special. And what they're called is a pneumatophore, or giver of breath. And the way they work, and I've got one prepared for you, is they allow gas exchange or oxygen to get down into that mud or sediment. So this is a pneumatophore. I've prepared this earlier and I've put a bulb at the end of it or a pipette to force air through it. I squeeze the pipette and look what happens. Air bubbles through. These roots are a giver of breath for the mangrove tree. So as the tide comes in, the air goes out, and as the tide goes out, the air comes in. So mangrove leaves are a really important food resource in this place. They're actually consumed by a whole range of different insects and other invertebrates. So if you look at these leaves, there's lots of blemishes, and holes through them. Some of those are caused by little mites, others are caused by the larvae of, of moths or caterpillars. And it's not just that. On this leaf here, I've got all these lumps, and those lumps are caused by a gall midge, basically a little fly that lays its larvae on the leaf or its egg. It causes a scar, and that little larvae can live inside that scar, getting all of its food and nourishment. It's perfectly safe, and when it's an adult, it erupts out and takes off. It starts the whole cycle again. And that brings me to another important point. That actually causes some of these leaves to drop off. And when they drop off, they become food for things like the crabs, or they get decomposed, a major food resource in this ecosystem. Now, lots of these insects are flying. And that leads me to the next big predator, or little predator. In this case, I'm talking about a little spider. And in here, there's a tiny little spider's nest, lots of little babies, there's been lots of flying insects that have become their meal. So you can see that mangrove leaves are very important for not only the insects, but the things they eat insects, the spiders and the birds. So now we're gonna wait for a sunset. I'm gonna climb up on the tower and see if we can see any birds of prey. And after that, we'll set up the light trap and see what comes out at night. So this is the best time of the afternoon for seeing birds of prey and right now I'm in the crow's nest which is probably the best vantage point in my opinion at Sydney Olympic Park. Well I'm not up on one of those tall units but, but I'm up here because right now it's a great opportunity to see birds of prey. 
So I'm really hoping to see a white-bellied seagull, which is one of the top birds of prey in this ecosystem and one of the apex predators uh, of Sydney Olympic Park. But any type of bird of prey would have me excited. What I'm using right now is my ears. But birds and the woodland birds and the birds in the, in the mangrove environment are really good at telling me what's going on. And so right now it's a good time for seeing things like a peregrine falcon or yesterday I saw a goshawk flying just over the canopy of the mangroves and stoop down in there to hunt some little birds, maybe silver eyes or something feeding in the mangroves. So the work is cut out for me. Uh, it's always an exciting time. If I get the shot, I'll be really happy. So I've just been setting up the light trap to see what insects are living in this forest of a night time. And while we were doing it, something quite incredible happened. I looked down in the water and it's absolutely teeming, boiling almost, with little shrimp or baby prawns. I don't know what, what species they are. But they're quite significant because these little characters are out there feeding on bits of organic matter, broken down stuff that's been trapped in this forest and they themselves underpin this ecosystem. Many of the fish here would feed on these as young fish until they got big enough to make their way back down to the ocean and become an important food resource. I love working around light traps. Now I set this up earlier today just so we could get a snapshot of what flying insects are living in this mangrove forest. Now it is the wrong season for bugs. We're almost in winter, things are cooling down, and as such, we don't see as much life as what normally would expect to see. And we're also surrounded by the city, which means many of those insects, instead of coming to my light, come to lights on people's homes. Light pollution is a major problem. It's a major problem because you need to think about these moths now, even things like the male mosquitoes and flies, they're a food input, they're an energy input into this forest. Now these flying insects, there's a couple of things going on here. Some of these moths, I don't know what species they are, I'll go home later and I'll look at my photos and I might be able to work out the genus. But what these moths are doing is some of them, they would have their larvae in this forest, either boring into the wood or eating the leaves. And as such, they're kind of getting some nutrients off the mangrove trees. But they themselves are an important part of the cycle. You see many of these insects, whether they begin life in the mangrove forest or in the surrounding woodlands, end up sometimes in the water. And when they're down in the water, that becomes a food resource, just like the shrimp, for many of the fish, some of which grow up in this ecosystem and make their way out to the ocean. So while I've got the light trap on and we've got insects flying towards it, it's a fantastic opportunity to listen for microbats. Now I like to call them military mosquito munching machines. So they use echolocation to find their prey. They see through sound. We can't really hear their calls. They live in these forests hunting as well as roosting in some of the hollows and other man-made structures around Sydney Olympic Park, like under some of our bridges. Now to locate them, I've got a bat detector which picks up the ultrasonic calls that we can't hear with our ears. Oh, there's one, can you hear it? I can't tell you what species it is on this device, but that doesn't matter. To know they're out there doing a good job, that's all that counts. Right now, this is a beautiful sight. It's a golden orb weaver. And spiders right across this ecosystem come in many shapes and sizes. These ones use webs. It's their food web. And right now, she's consuming a honeybee. But some of the spiders down this place, they jump and pounce, catching flies. Others spring up out of holes. And maybe they'll grab a little beetle or something walking along. But either way, spiders are really important in the mangrove environment because they help to control the insect population. 
and they themselves, along with the insects, are an important food resource for some of the birds that live here, like the grey butcher bird, and if they end up on the water, guess what? They'll get gobbled up by a fish. So at the moment, I've got this great little opportunity. I can see a thornbill feeding up in the canopy. And down lower, look at that. There's some superb fairy wrens. And they're all out here feeding on little insects, like mosquitoes and midges. But we've got a whole range of woodland birds that aren't just restricted to mangrove forests coming into here. Like the Australian raven that's been calling off in the background. Ravens, pied currawongs and things like the grey butcher bird coming to here. They hunt some of the little birds, but they also specialise and scavenge on the things that get stuck in here from the tidal movement, like maybe a dead fish or a crab. And there's all sorts of birds, even things like, I've seen rainbow lorikeet come and nesting in here. And the other day we had a yellow-tailed black cockatoo coming in. It was tearing bark off one of the mangrove trees. What I can assume it was doing is it was getting borers underneath, inside that timber, little grubs and larvae. There's a raven. Stay over there. So this place isn't restricted to just mangrove and intertidal species. We've got things coming in from outside this place. Hey, cheeky. So looking at the mangroves and those birds flying in from other ecosystems, like the butcher birds and hunting in there, they're more of a generalist species and they're not, you know, specifically evolved to mangroves and nor are they tied to mangroves. Coming up into this environment, we're looking for a different type of bird. Birds that are shore birds and wading birds that have got a range of adaptations to deal with this ecosystem. A place of mud, rapid water change, and even stuff like salt and hard slippery prey. Really special spot. This billabong, just off the beaten track, is absolutely teeming with different types of bird life. Probably one of the most diverse areas you can see things. And what's beautiful at the moment is they're all up here in the pneumatophores and amongst the mangrove trees and they're hunting. It's really pretty special right now. There are so many different types of water birds feeding here. Right now I can see some egrets, white-faced heron. I've got some ibis with that big probing beak at the back going through the sediment, the actual natural habitat, not bins. And cormorants, they're corralling fish into the pneumatophores, kind of like a fishing net, and they're grabbing them. And right out the back, we've got silver gulls and pelicans, and they're feeding on, I assume, more fish. But all the way through this place, there's a really good diversity of bird life. Other parts here in the park, like the water bird refuge, we've got swans and teals and other types of ducks. And spoonbills, they're a really astonishing bird. They've got this pronounced beak that's shaped like a spoon at the end. And they use it, well they have like really sensitivity on the end of it. And whenever something like a crab or an insect or a fish touches it, they snap it shut and gobble it up. There's a lot going on and I would love to know more about their feeding. So I'm on my way up to the Smart Gate because it's a place where lots of the fish get funneled to. It's a good spot to see where all those water birds were feeding on down the billabong. This is a good spot here to show you. Looking out here is interesting because that's that salt marsh and there's a couple of mangrove seedlings in here but this isn't really the mangrove forest. That's at the back. But down there we've actually got those mud flats and that's that really productive area for fish and water birds or wading birds. And the mud flats themselves, you get down there, it's fairly shallow water. You've got this deep sedimentary layer and that's teeming with life. Lots of little, you know, invertebrates, worms and, and it's, it's the food for so much of the stuff that lives here. 
as a productive ecosystem, mud flats are so valuable because they go up and down with the tides. The depth of water that covers that mud, or that sediment, it's always changing. And when it gets lower, or well, gives an access for different birds to feed. So obviously here there's variation in beak sizes and leg lengths. And without that shifting height, it would mean that maybe one species could get a real good monopoly on all the food in there. But because it is constantly changing, as it changes, it offers different opportunities for different species. So it makes it a very dynamic sort of place. Now I've come to the Waterbird Refuge up here on the edge of the mangroves because it's a really good place to observe some of the aquatic life. Now this gate and these wetlands, they're a wetland of national importance. And that's because so many birds utilise this area, not only from Australia, but international migratory birds, such as the bar-tailed godwit. And because this is a smart gate that controls the water flow here, this gate moves up and down, and it's also a really great place for us today to observe the fish that live in this ecosystem. Now, I would have loved to have shown you the fish swimming in amongst the mangroves, but I really don't want to go down there and tread on those pneumatophores because it wouldn't be good for the mangrove trees. So we've come here to observe some of the fish life here because it's a funnel. This gate channels a lot of water out of this refuge, and by doing so, it really concentrates the number of fish living here. So popping this camera down in the water, Let's see what we can see. And already I can see heaps of stuff here in the gate. Oh, we've got things like puffer fish. We've seen some potty mullet out the back. Oh my goodness, all those catfish, schooling catfish. <laughs> it's a really, really dynamic place. Ooh. There's even eels. You know, it's, oh wow. I can't believe this. Let's see what else is feeding on the broken down organic matter. So this is a really great site. Down here, we've actually got one of the key players in all the ecosystems, or most ecosystems, fungi. I, I really love, these are mushrooms that are growing off a log. So it's part of the food web. It's a decomposer. Down here, You've got a little beetle, where are you, you little cheeky thing? There he is. I don't know what this beetle is. Look at that, a little red and black beetle. That's really important because that itself is getting nutrients from this log. It couldn't do it without the fungi. It's eating the fungus itself. And the beauty of it is, just to demonstrate, look at that. When I squeeze this log, it flexes. And that's because the body of the fungi the mycelium, the hyphae, is growing through this log. This mushroom itself is just how the mushroom makes more mushrooms. It's, it's reproduction. You see lots of fungi or mushrooms growing on the mangrove trees. And it's eating at the center of the tree sometimes. The tree can live perfectly fine with that. But the beauty of that, what it's doing, is it's creating a cavity or a hollow habitat for a whole range of different animals, with maybe little micro bats, birds, skinks, and that's really important because it allows those animals to live safely and maybe breed. And not only that, while it's rotting out the centre of a tree, it's also releasing more nutrients for living parts of the tree to grow. And the animals that come to those hollows, they're probably going to poo in those hollows, which is also more nutrients for this environment to thrive on. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk down the boardwalk. And because it's low tide, it gives us a great opportunity to look at the things that are feeding on the broken down organic matter. This is a beautiful site. We've got branches and leaves and everything down in the sediment. You see, as these mangrove trees get a bit of damage from insect attack, maybe a bird or a cockatoo snaps off a branch, or fungi hollows out a mangrove tree and one day in a wind it breaks off, that organic matter, those leaves, branches and twigs, it hits the sediment and it gets disassembled, gets decomposed by stuff like bacteria and fungi. And when that occurs, it ends up making this really important product in this ecosystem. I'm talking about biofilm. So biofilm is broken down organic matter 
mixed with stuff like algae. And that becomes a food resource for the deposit feeders. And what I'm talking about is the crabs and the snails. Now this is pretty neat. I'm watching or filming a crab right now. And this crab, you can see him gathering up a little ball or a bolus of biofilm and shoveling in its mouth, as well as eating a bit of mangrove leaf, because they do actually eat the leaves that aren't broken down. And what's brilliant now is it's just taking its load all the way down into its hole. It's really neat watching the crabs use their holes. Now they make their holes as a bit of a safe place for them to get away. When it's high tide, if the crabs are out walking on the pneumatophores and on the sediment, they'd be prey for things like fish and eels. And when it's low tide, they don't want to stray too far from their holes because if they're too far from them, something like a raven or an ibis could easily get to them. And their holes are deep, so those big ibis probing beaks can't quite reach them. Now, those holes are also very, very important for this whole ecosystem because they allow oxygen to also get down into the sediment which helps the mangrove tree roots grow. This platform gives me a great opportunity to get down close and personal with the mangrove snails. And I know they're here because I can see their squirrely poops. See, as these snails are feeding, they're eating stuff like the algae and the biofilm, and almost at the same time, the poo seems to be coming out. And there are these little squiggly patterns all over, and that's that, the poo. Now, these mangrove snails, like many of the other organisms living in this environment, have hard shells. And that's good protection for them for a lot of the predators. Things such as the birds or even fish. Fish like brim often will crunch things like their mollusks. Now, looking down here, there's a mangrove snail. That shell on the underside where their foot is, the snail's foot, is also like a, a trapdoor. And so it's another good adaptation for them because it helps to stop them desiccating in the hot sun. Or a better word would be drying out. Get him back down there. Oh wow, look at this. The beginning is a biofilm. I've just found this mangrove leaf as well. And all that's left remaining are the veins. It's pretty much a skeleton. And so this is decomposition in the making. Or well, all the happening, probably a more accurate term. And so a lot of the flesh has been decomposed off and that's become biofilm. And we've just left with this scaffold of veins. And by the looks of it, maybe some crabs and snails have also had a bit of a go at it. So we've looked at lots of the big stuff, but one of the big players in this place is the bacteria, the algae and the fungi, the microscopic stuff and it's in the water and it's in the sediment. It's what breaks down the mangrove leaves and organic matter and it releases the nutrients that makes this place run and the mangrove trees thrive. So I'm gonna get two samples, bit of water, bit of sediment and use a microscope and see what's really making this place tick. Just get a little bit of water bit of sediment. stuff in there. Just think about that bacteria and fungi and the crazy life going down there. That's what's making the biofilm and breaking down all those mangrove leaves. Ah, I'll put the sediment under now. Oh, wow, look at the world this reveals. Just looking down here, oh, there's so much life, bacteria and algae and all these crazy little things doing zoomies and swirls stuff that breaks down the mangrove leaves and makes the biofilm. It's literally underneath the crab's noses and ours. It's the nuts and bolts of the mangrove ecosystem. <laughs> That's cool. Now this is a really interesting spot. Over there is a freshwater wetland 
and behind me is the Bardu mangroves. Now, there is a little bit of tidal flow that occasionally reaches this freshwater wetland, so it's probably more likely brackish. Because it's mainly fresh, it's a habitat for a whole other different range of animals. And I'm talking about freshwater water bugs. And what I'm really interested in are the dragonflies. You see, dragonflies start their life in the freshwater. As a nymph, this crazy predator that has a mouth that shoots out from underneath it, can even catch things like fish. But as adults, they actually climb up on a reed, they molt out of their skin, and they end up flying into the mangrove forest where they do a good job for every one of us. They're out there hunting aerial insects as well. Things like mosquitoes, so I'm always happy to see them. So I'm hoping to catch a few flying over the water. I guess I won't be seeing any seagulls up in this tower. The mangroves, just like the triffids, have taken over. Pretty cool though. I've just come down from the mangrove tree canopy, where this adventure began. See, keen to understand how these mangrove trees underpinned the whole way this environment works has been a beautiful thing for me. To know that the sun's energy photosynthesis makes these trees grow and make their own food and that means there's food for insects living on those leaves and those insects they're food for spiders and the woodland birds that come in looking for the spiders and the insects you wouldn't expect to see in this ecosystem it's pretty astonishing and when those leaves drop down onto the sediment they decompose bacteria and fungi break it down and that makes that great product biofilm which feeds the crabs and the shrimp and the snails and following those little animals are things like fish and birds and some of those fish they grow up nice big and healthy in this environment and eventually they make their way back down to the pacific ocean where they may feed a shark a dolphin or even us and some of those birds coming into this place are wading in the water with those big sharp beaks of theirs and they're catching fish and they themselves may become food for something like a white-bellied sea eagle. Any way you look at this ecosystem, it's extremely diverse. And what makes it so special is this was once upon a time extremely degraded and it's been restored. Restored to a level now that people choose to come here to connect to one another and to nature. I've really loved being on this journey and I haven't discovered all the species that are out there, which gives me a great excuse to keep going.